This video is brought to you today by The Great Courses Plus, an in-depth online learning platform that lets you access courses taught by top academics and even institutions like National Geographic and the Smithsonian. You can learn at your own pace with no schedules or testing, yet gain every bit of the knowledge you'd get from a university course. More on that later. So for a free trial, head over to The Great Courses Plus at www.thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash John Michael Godier. While many of the solar system's moons are prominently discussed, such as our moon, Europa, and Enceladus, there are some moons in the solar system that are very bizarre in their own right, but not well understood. So here are 10 somewhat neglected moons in the solar system that are outright strange. Number 10. Io While many of the moons of the solar system are notable for having liquid water oceans locked under ice, or for that matter, liquid hydrocarbons on their surface, there is another body in the solar system other than Earth that has liquid lava on its surface. It's wildly volcanic Io. The reason Io is so volcanically active is because of its proximity to Jupiter. The little world is so close that Jupiter's gravity flexes it, causing Io to remain very hot. Add that with Jupiter constantly bathing Io in radiation, and you have what must be one of the harshest environments in the solar system. Oddly though, Io is still a long-shot candidate for life. It's thought that it once had as much water as any of the other Galilean moons of Jupiter, significant amounts of it that likely had a liquid phase before it all disappeared, but it's not completely gone. It could still be present below the surface. As such, it has been suggested, though a long shot, that perhaps deep in a moist lava tube somewhere below the surface of Io there might be, or once have been, simple life. Number 9. Nereid Nereid is a fairly obscure moon of Neptune, its third largest, only discovered in 1949 by Gerard Kuiper, the namesake of the Kuiper Belt. We don't know much about this moon, Voyager 2 passed close enough to take vague photographs, but nothing even close to high resolution. Water ice has been detected on its surface, and very likely rock, but that's about all we really know about the object itself. But there are oddities. One is Nereid's eccentricity, which is the highest for any moon in the solar system. At its furthest from Neptune, it is nearly 10 million kilometers distant. At its closest, it's just over 1 million kilometers. This may suggest that it's a captured object, perhaps a wandering Kuiper Belt object. But from what we know about its composition, it doesn't look much like other outer solar system objects, suggesting that it actually formed around Neptune. It could be that during the capture of the moon Triton, which was probably originally a Kuiper Belt object itself, Nereid's orbit was affected in the process to create the eccentricity. But there's another mystery here. Some observations since the 1980s show that Nereid varies in brightness on a scale of sometimes years, but at other times only a few days. Yet other observations don't show this. So whatever is causing it, it seems pretty chaotic. There is currently no good explanation for this. Number 8. Iepetus the discovery of Saturn's moon Iepetus is noteworthy for how early it happened. In 1671, Italian astronomer Giovanni Domenico Cassini observed it just on the western side of Saturn. He assumed that as it orbited, it would reappear on the eastern side. It didn't as far as he could see, and it remained that way for several years. He'd see it on the western side, but not the eastern side. So he obtained a better telescope and in 1705 finally spotted it much dimmer on the eastern side. In what was an amazing feat of early observational telescope astronomy, he determined that Iepetus has a dark side and a light side, and that the moon was tightly locked to Saturn. This turned out to be correct, centuries before detailed images of Iepetus could be had, and indeed the dark region is now called Cassini Regio in his honor. That aside, once we did visit Iepetus with several probes, the most in-depth being a probe named after Cassini, we found a very strange world indeed. Firstly, because of a highly inclined orbit, Iepetus would be the only large moon of Saturn where the rings would not appear edge-on, and thus would be easily visible. Perhaps spectacularly so. Why this inclined orbit is the case is still a complete mystery. Iepetus is a very icy world, over 80% of it being icy, it's thought, and even seems to undergo landslides on its surface. It's heavily cratered, some of which are enormous, and why one side of it is dark and the other side is light is thought to be because of warmer areas of the moon sublimating and leaving dark, carbonaceous deposits behind, with bright ice accumulating on the lighter side. But the oddest aspect of Iepetus is its huge ridge. This ridge is mostly contained to the dark region of the moon, 
but some mountain peaks seem to continue it somewhat into the bright region. Explanations for this range from Iapetus once having had a ring of its own that accumulated down onto the surface over time, or geologic processes that formed it, but none of the present proposed explanations for how this could have formed explain why it's so concentrated on the dark side. Number 7. Mimas Saturn's moon Mimas would otherwise not be very noteworthy other than its superficial resemblance to the Death Star from Star Wars, but in this case its formation would have very nearly been the death of Mimas. The crater is the second largest crater in comparison to overall size of any known body in the solar system other than another Saturn moon, Tethys. Given that Mimas is mostly made of ice, it's somewhat surprising that the formation of this crater didn't shatter the tiny world into pieces, but there are indications that this almost happened. On the opposite side of Mimas are what appear to be stress fractures in the ice that appear to be a result of shock waves generated by the impact. Number 6. Miranda While it's not known just how Mimas managed to survive its giant impact, there is one object that may not have survived an impact at all and had to reform entirely from the pieces, or at least that's one hypothesis. It's Uranus's moon Miranda, and shows some of the wildest topography in the solar system, ranging from enormous canyons, the largest known cliff in the solar system, and very obvious broken terrain. What caused this is unclear, but hypotheses range from extensional tectonics, where liquid water froze beneath the surface, expanding and cracking the surface. There is evidence of past cryovolcanism, where a mixture of water and ammonia might have flowed in the past like lava does here on Earth cratering on Miranda's surface suggests a mostly, but not entirely, old surface, but the crater seemed softened, perhaps by that same cryovolcanism. It may also be that Miranda was torn apart and reformed in the past, but that hypothesis has been losing favor in recent years. Unfortunately, we haven't seen all of this tumultuous, unique world. Only one half of it has been imaged to date. What features we might find on the other side remain to be seen. Number 5. Dactyl. One perhaps surprising thing about moons in the solar system is that not all of them are bound to planets. In 1993, the Galileo probe on its way to Jupiter visited the asteroid 243 Ida. As the data from the spacecraft was being downloaded and analyzed, it was noted that Ida had a moon. Known as Dactyl, the origin of this tiny object seems to be linked with Ida itself, either forming when Ida did, when a parent object broke up, or was formed from a piece of Ida during an impact. But the composition of both Ida and Dactyl are very similar, and indeed similar to the most common type of meteorite found on Earth, the common chondrites. One oddity, however, is that Ida showed itself to have been subject to weathering in space, a reddening of its surface, whereas Dactyl showed less of this kind of weathering. Why this is, is not well understood. Number 4. Ganymede Jupiter's moon Ganymede is noteworthy not only for being the largest moon in the solar system, it's bigger than the planet Mercury and Pluto, it's also noteworthy in that it has a magnetic field. And that field is affected by what very well may be the largest liquid water ocean in the solar system, far surpassing Earth. Ice shell moons that have liquid water layers are common in the solar system, but Ganymede's circumstances allow for a very thick layer of liquid water this may allow for a very unique situation, where rather than just an ocean per se, it may be several oceans stacked in layers separated by alternating layers of water ice in different crystalline states caused by temperature and pressure. This creates questions about whether Ganymede might be habitable all around for life, in that it might be habitable only at certain layers, or no layers, and it's hard to predict if any layers in between the ices might be habitable as ice in different phases behaves differently than normal ice in your refrigerator, which floats in water. Denser forms of ice, however, would sink instead of float, and might form an ice floor at the bottom of Ganymede's oceans that might prevent interaction between the water and the rocky surface below, affecting the availability of nutrients. But the water at Ganymede does appear to be salty, so it's anyone's guess what might be going on down in that high-pressure environment. Number 3. Phobos's Death Wish the moons of Mars are moons in the sense that they are in orbit of Mars, but not particularly impressive ones, and really are more like asteroids than anything else. But that may change. The moon Phobos, which is named after the Greek god and personification of fear, something that may well be relevant to any Mars colonists living on the planet in the future, is slowly moving closer to Mars. Sometime within the next 30 to 50 million years, one of two things is expected to happen. 
Either Phobos will fall into and impact Mars, which would probably be quite the spectacle and could form a huge crater, or it will be torn apart by tidal forces and turn Mars into a ringed planet for a time. This would be a very different look for Mars indeed, and interesting, because by that time Saturn may well have lost a significant portion of its ring system. That's if it happens at all. 30 to 50 million years is a very long time, and if the human species lasts that long, we may well have completely terraformed Mars into Earth too at that point, in which case Phobos and the other moon Diemos may well have long ago been converted into raw materials for space habitats. Would you live on a space station that was once a moon called Fear? Number 2. Epimetheus and Janus In addition to acting as shepherd moons maintaining the sharp edge of Saturn's A-ring, these two moons do something very unusual. They swap orbits. The moons are on two very similar orbits, one slightly further out than the other. The closer orbit is slightly faster than the outer orbit. As they near each other through gravitational interaction, a momentum exchange occurs, causing the moons to swap while never approaching closer than about 10,000 kilometers. This dance happens about once every four years, and is the only known example of an orbital configuration like this present in the solar system. Number 1. Charon When the New Horizons probe passed through the Pluto-Charon system, what was once thought to be a frozen, rather boring solar system backwater, turned out to be one of the most exciting and dynamic sets of objects in the solar system. Pluto was a showstopper, and certainly worthy of the category of planet, showing all sorts of interesting geology, organics, atmospheric mysteries, and such making it one of the most enigmatic objects in the solar system. But its moon Charon also proved to be full of surprises. Before its 1978 discovery in photographic plates by astronomer James Christie at the U.S. Naval Observatory, Charon was unknown but it had oddly been predicted by sci-fi author Edmund Hamilton in his 1940 novel, Calling Captain Future, where he described Pluto as having three moons. It actually has five, but Charon particularly stands out. Charon and Pluto more accurately could be described as a double minor planet system, with Charon being about half the diameter of Pluto. One of the many oddities of this system is that the reddish patch that you see at the pole of Charon is actually part of Pluto's atmosphere, Yes, Pluto periodically has an atmosphere and transfers components of it to Charon's surface, but it's not just any material, it's organic tholins, molecules that may be related to life. One debate that's currently going on is how Charon formed. One idea is that it's a product of a glancing blow early in Pluto's history, much like our own moon is thought to be a product of such a collision. Two objects hit and destroy each other and then reform into new bodies. The geology does not seem to bear this out, however, suggesting rather that Pluto and Charon have always been separate objects, but collided very gently at some point and came into an orbital equilibrium afterward. Also going on here is a rare case of mutual tidal locking. With Earth, the Moon always presents the same face to us, but Earth does not present the same face to the Moon. With Pluto and Charon, they always present the same face towards each other. Charon also seems to be geologically active, with cryogeysers and potentially even cryovolcanoes spraying out ice crystals and making fresh deposits on the surface. This may have led to a very strange type of feature on Charon. Described as a mountain in a moat, this feature, named Kubrick Mons after director Stanley Kubrick, is literally a mountain that's sitting in a depression. One idea is that this formed when a cryovolcano basically deflated the ground under it by depleting the reserves of ices underneath but that explanation remains far from settled. Sinking mountains, as it were. As data from New Horizons continues to be analyzed, even more mysteries of this strange moon may come to light. This list was just a sampling of the many moons that the solar system has to offer, and we very likely don't know about a significant portion of them yet. As we explore objects in the Kuiper Belt, some of which can be larger than Mercury or Pluto, or if Planet Nine is ever detected, which it may well have large moons of its own, then the list of strange moons of the solar system will grow. And there are other strange things lurking out there, such as the asteroid 10199 Shariklo, which does not have a known moon, but indeed is the only asteroid known to date to have its own ring system. Imagine what we will find as we continue to explore the solar system. You may not know it, but in addition to science, my interests also include history, particularly ancient and medieval history, and how that applies to the formation of modern science. I recently took to watching science and historical content over at The Great Courses Plus, where they have extensive historical and scientific content, including in-depth multiple lecture discussions of the 1066 Norman Conquest of England. 
marked particularly by an apparition of Holly's Comet during that year, and other topics such as tours of the historic medieval cities of Europe, decisive battles of world history, a day in the life of Pompeii, and many more lecture series covering scientific topics such as quantum mechanics and even the basics of the periodic table. In addition to science and history courses, The Great Courses Plus also offers extensive selections on health and fitness, cooking, philosophy, finance, language, and many, many more, all taught by top educators and experts in their fields. As I said in the beginning, it's university-level education, but done at your own pace, with no tests or need to write reports, only pure learning. And best of all, it's very easy to navigate and access whether you're on your computer, phone, or tablet with the Great Courses Plus app, with over 10,000 lectures available to choose from. Learn at your own pace, when you want, and where you want. And here's the best part. You can try it for free by going to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash John Michael Godier, or click on the link in the description below to start your free trial. Check out The Great Courses Plus today. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about the solar system's apparent deliciousness. First, it was claims that the moon must be made of green cheese because it sort of looks like it to some, apparently. I don't see that, but it's hard to ignore that Io looks like a really nice cheese pizza. And there's Jupiter, which looks like an incompletely mixed glass of chocolate milk. And then there's Earth, which is fruited with many excellent things to eat no matter what your tastes are. And then there are the numerous comets and asteroids that tend to resemble potatoes. Not sure where I'm going with this one, but I'm suddenly hungry. Be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.